I want to welcome you to the event, Getting Smarter About Smart Cities. My name is Robert Fuentes with the Brookings Institution's uh, Metropolitan Policy Program. We're right across uh, the street here. We have our Christmas party tonight, so SEIU was lucky enough to, or fortunate enough to uh, have us over here today. So, um, again, I want to thank everybody for dealing with the, with the weather problems and dealing with this, this shift in schedule. Um, it's a really good group that we've assembled here today. An excellent set of leaders from the United States, from Europe, um, from Canada to really help us kind of wrestle through some of these issues that we've been trying to deal with um, with smart cities for a long time. Um, they want to help us understand the broader perspectives about smart cities. We want to understand the promise. We want to understand uh, the rationale uh, and how we can help support our metropolitan economies. At Brookings, we're, we're believers in the promise um, of smart cities. We really think that there's something here. We really think that this can do a lot to advance uh, metropolitan health and competitiveness. Um, and we're very happy to co-sponsor and co-host this with our friends uh, at the Asade Business School uh, in Barcelona. And I will introduce Jonathan Wareham from Asade in just a second. Uh, but first, I want to thank him uh, and his team for helping us pull this together. This is not something we could have done by ourselves here in Washington. Um, you know, it's hard enough to pull together a Washington-based event with just folks from Washington. You add an international component, it gets exponentially more difficult. So thanks to, uh, uh, thanks to him and the team and the team from Brookings. Um, you know, I don't know how people did these things 20 years ago. We were emailing and tweeting all week, worrying about the weather. We were tracking flights uh, in real time. Um, we were emailing contingency plans, what we were going to do here today. So um, I don't know if that's a metaphor or anything about smart cities, but certainly it helped us uh, um, this weekend get through um, planning for this event. I don't think it helped the staff very much, but uh, it helped me anyway. That was a good thing. Um, so thank you to them. Um, this event is, is uh, made possible by our, our sponsors, uh, uh, Hitachi, Microsoft, SAP, Siemens, and our Metropolitan Leadership Council provide support for Brookings, uh, and they're helping us think through all these larger issues, again, around smart cities. So in broad terms, what we want to do here today is to provide clarity um, to this issue around uh, the larger discussions about smart cities. We're not going to discuss rankings of smart cities. We're not going to rank different cities against one another, nor are we going to tie ourselves uh, in knots over definitions about what smart cities are. I think we generally have understandings about what this is. I mean, smart cities incorporates technology into the built environment, whether it's energy, transportation, payment technologies, um, sensors, information systems, weather information systems, we found out this weekend. Um, but we think the technology itself is not the only thing that we're talking about here today. A key characteristic that we think about smart cities is that these places are integrated rather than compartmentalized. Uh, in the real world, residences, businesses, all understand the fundamental connections between things like transportation, energy, housing, community development, economic development, energy, uh, the environment. It's only in the, the stovepipe world of government bureaucracy where these things are kept apart and they're often kept uh, two separate. So a smart city to us uses public and private technology to break down those silos uh, and help places run better. But maybe most importantly for this conversation and for us is that a smart city also knows what its economy is. It knows the components that go into it and how it, that economy's performance can be enhanced through technology. All this means a new approach to regional economic development through a true assessment of the dynamics and the uh, performance of the local economy and a real understanding of region strengths, challenges, opportunities, all in the context of larger global trends. Because we think all of this smartness, all this data, all the sensors and the devices and the information doesn't do us any good if it's just going to enable us to make bad decisions faster. Or if it's going to enable us to just justify the decisions we were going to make, you know, in the first place. The point is to inform those decisions so they actually result uh, in better outcomes. Now, while many firms are already engaged in cooperative projects throughout the world, and we're going to hear a lot about some of the best practices uh, at the panel that's going to follow here today, um, we think there's still much more work that needs to be done about smart cities, particularly here uh, in the United States, to make it more the norm rather than the exception. Fortunately, we're finding that cities uh, in metropolitan areas uh, and the networks of political, business, civic, corporate, um, labor, environmental leaders are all doing things right now out in the real world in the United States um, to do, as we like to say in the U.S., to get stuff done. Sometimes we say stuff, sometimes we say something else, but the point is to get things done at a time when this town in particular uh, seems rather shut down. These leaders are stepping up and they're doing the hard work to grow jobs and restructure the economy for the long haul, and they're doing this in a way that leverages their distinct assets and advantages 
in the global economy. So in speaking with Johnson, Jonathan and our friends from Asade earlier this year, really now, um, it's clear that in both of our worlds, what people really need, what cities and metros need, is to learn from one another, to find out what's happening, what's working, what's not working, um, to, in order to make these smart city debates really meaningful. We think the technological hurdles are real. We understand that they're out there. Privacy concerns, all these things are certainly real. But we think those things are surmountable. We can get beyond that. The real challenge now is lack of clarity, how to add real value, and what workable public and private business models really look like. And the best way to do that is to hear from people who are actually doing stuff out in the real world. So that's why we're here today and where we're going to focus. We have a great panel that's going to help us do that. Um, we also have Chris Vane here from the World Bank, who's a, a, a worldwide leader in all this, who's going to provide the keynote uh, after we're done to really help us provide, you know, to give us some of those examples about what's going on. But in addition to the panel, I want to mention, we've also convened, we've brought in to get, uh, today another 10 U.S. and five international cities that are here to help us dig into this issue um, in, in much, more, uh, much more detail, much more workshop kind of session that we're going to convene later today uh, and also talk about tomorrow. So this work doesn't end for us here today um, when this event is over, but hopefully through this network of people that we're starting to build all throughout the world, um, that this is just the beginning. So let me call up and again thank uh, Jonathan Wareham, who is a professor of information systems and vice dean for research at ASADE, as well as the director of the ASADE Institute for Innovation and Knowledge Management in Barcelona. ASADE has really been a great intellectual and uh, logistical partner with us on all this stuff. So please join me in welcoming Jonathan Wareham, who will introduce our panel. Well, thank you very much, Robert Puentes, and, and your entire team uh, at Brookings for the invitation and to, to, to come and, and co-organize this, this wonderful event. Uh, you may be asking yourselves, well, you know, what lot, why do we need someone from Barcelona to come and talk about this stuff? Uh, and that's a very good question. Barcelona recently hosted a very, very large uh, Smart Cities World Expo uh, a couple weeks ago, which many of you, I think, actually attended. Um, and the idea is, you know, Barcelona very much wants to brand itself as one of these types of smart cities. Um, to put itself on the, on the world map is, is a hub of activity around this. Europeans, as you well, may well understand, have a different philosophy or ethos of the role of public life versus the private sector. You know, private sector, public sector relationships. And in general, speaking in broad terms, they have a larger public sector. And so that means that they, they assume a different flavor, a different way of thinking about how these public sector initiatives should be. And that's why we're here, to simply provide a complementary view on what smart cities should be. Different, not better, just different. Okay? So this is what we're hoping to tease out, some of these contrasts, tease out some of the variants a little bit so we can understand the different contexts. Um, at a lot of these events that we've been attending for the past number of years, and I'm sure many of you have, have felt the same way, the, the feeling is, is this is largely a vendor-driven conversation, right? People are selling stuff on a very, very large scale. They smell money, and um, many of you have it, and, and, and they, want to, they want you to buy their products and services and so forth. And as a result, some of the conversation is not very critical. It's, it's, it's really um, very much on the push side, very much kind of selling these utopian visions and so forth, which, you know, coming from institutions like think tanks like Brookings or an educational institution, you're trained to think, be a little bit skeptical about some of this stuff, right? That's what we're trained to do. So the purpose of this workshop is to get to people um, up here who are, you could say, you know, on the buy side, who have to make difficult decisions about expending limited economic resources and defending these decisions in a very highly political context to justify the value of what they're doing. We don't see very much of those conversations going on, and hence that's why we're motivated to come here and, and, and hopefully learn something. Now, in, in broad terms, I can name some, you know, just a few superficials or, 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 or high-level questions that, that we think are interesting. First of all, is this idea of, you know, Let's get as much data out there as we can. Let's create as, 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 as many ecosystems and platforms as we can so we can generate as, as many apps as we can. And this seems to be the general philosophy of many cities around the world. The question is, is this really valuable? And if so, where and why, right? We know from studying open source communities that the, the, the open source 
platforms follow a long tail distribution. That is, very few of them are very, very successful, but the rest are, are, are just left by the wayside, and one would expect a similar phenomenon to happen here. So this issue of, you know, what, where do they become successful and why is very, very interesting for us. Right? Secondly, if you are a representative of a city or region, how would you govern this type of thing, right? You don't just let a thousand flowers grow, um, but you have to come up with rules, with filters, with selection criteria, with design mechanisms that actually make this activity valuable, not only for the app developers, but for your citizens. So how do you do that? That's kind of on the technology push side. On you know, the receiving side is the citizen response, right? Are citizens actually using this stuff? Do they benefit from it? If so, why? You know, one gets the idea of, well, you know, knowing that the street lamp is broken, there's a pothole here, and when the bus comes, that's nice to have. But what is the real long-term social value of this? Or, equally important, the long-term business value. Finally, we can think about policy implications. If city governments or regional governments are doing these sort of things, once the technology is out there, the sensors are out there, the data are out there, the, the apps are out there, what does this mean for their internal processes? What does this mean for the social contract between the citizens and the governments? What changes? What's different? Why is this interesting? And as Robert mentioned, you know, of course, is there a relationship between the long-term economic sustainability of the city, the city or the region? Um, can that be substantiated, or is this just more political window dressing? Right? And I'm being a little bit cynical, but that's why we're here, is to tease this out and to have a substantial conversation about where this adds value, why, and how it can be cultivated um, um, and to the benefits of, of the citizens and the policy makers. So, on that note, I would like to introduce Adi Tumera. He's going to moderate a panel of very qualified individuals who can help us learn about some of these topics, I hope. Thank you very much, and thank you for the invitation.